you. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters. What a crowd. It is so great to be here uh, with all of you. Thank you to my good friend, Owen. Uh, and you know it's a friend when you're running for Senate for the first time, and no one knows who you are, and you got no place to stay, and he let me stay in the couch, OK? That is true. Um, and uh, he has been an incredible friend to me um, from the time we were in Minnesota uh, to the time I'm in this job. Um, and I remember, Owen uh, remembers this, the first time I actually ever came to Washington uh, was when I was in my old job, I was the county attorney, and I got invited uh, to come to Washington for some uh, crime bill, a hate crimes bill. And um, it was, President Clinton was president. I'd never been in the White House before, and at the last minute they asked me to introduce him, right? So I'm literally standing outside of that East Room, and Bill Clinton's on one side, Janet Reno's on the other, and the military band starts playing that song, do, 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 you know? Hail to the Chief, and I'm super nervous. I just start walking in, and all of a sudden I feel this big hand on my shoulder, and this voice says, I know you're going to do great out there, but when they play that song, I usually go first. <laughs> that is a true story. That happened. Bill Clinton remembers that story. Hey. So that was the first time I was in the White House, but I don't think it's going to be the last. All right. So it is great to be here uh, with your president, Bob Martinez. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, your General uh, Secretary Treasurer, uh, Dora Cervantes, thank you so much. Uh, my fellow Minnesotan, Steve Galloway, who's the General Vice President for the Midwest Territory, um, and all of your leaders here with the Machinist Union. I had uh, such a great welcome when we were out in Nevada. I enjoyed that very much, and uh, have just seen you in action all over the country. In 2018, you worked with us in every state in the union, and you made the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., once again, the people's house. Yes. You did that. You did that in every district in this country. When that tragedy happened in Aurora, Illinois, you sent your critical incident response team to support survivors when that gunman opened fire, killing five people, two of whom were IAM members. And by the way, that's part of why I just came out with this mental health addiction policy for the whole country. I don't think you've ever seen something like this from a presidential candidate, but one in five Americans right now are dealing with mental illness. One in five. One out of two American families have some kind of addiction, even in their family, or if they're friends, or have it themselves. And yet nothing except rhetoric has been coming out of this town when it comes to mental illness. It is time to act, and I want to thank the Machinist Union for taking this on in your own union. Thank you, thank you so much, Bob, for standing for your members. <laughs> After the devastation of Hurricane Maria, you partnered with airlines to fly goods and disaster relief to Puerto Rico. That's community. That's a shared story. That is ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm running for president because I believe in that kind of community that we've got right in this room. And I see it fractured every single day in this country. You know, I announced my candidacy for president in the middle of an island, in the middle of the Mississippi River, in the middle of a blizzard. OK, I didn't expect the blizzard. Um, by the end of it, if any of you saw it, I had so much snow on my head that it was like watching yourself grow old in 20 minutes when I watched the video. It was quite a scene. And then I had the fun that the president actually gave me a nickname. He tweeted out. And he said, made fun of me for uh, talking about climate change in the middle of a blizzard. And then he gave me the name Snow Woman. And I thought, you know, that's not that bad. And then I finally tweeted back at him, I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Umbrella Man. Just gives you a sense of how I think we need to deal with them. So I stood by that river for a reason. 
Um, and that is, I wanted to make that point that even when there's a blizzard, I'm gonna be there. Because I've got grit, and you need grit to take this guy on, and you need grit to run this country, and you need grit to win this office. So this is my story. As no one noted, I come from a union family. My grandpa was a minor. Uh, he had to quit school at age 15 to support his nine brothers and sisters. The youngest, Hannah, had to go to an orphanage in Duluth when their parents died. She was eight years old, and he promised he'd go get her. And two years later, he borrowed a car, and he went and he brought her back. And he was the oldest boy, and he wanted to be in the Navy, but instead, he went down in a mining shaft every single day, 1,500 feet. When Owen was talking about looking at policy above 30,000 feet, that we got too many people doing that, I'm not like that, because it was my grandpa that went down underground 1,500 feet every day with that lunch bucket. And then he wanted a better life for my dad, and he decided that he was going to save money in a coffee can to send my dad to college. And my dad ended up getting a two-year community college degree. That's why I'm such a big believer in your trainings that you do with the Machinist Union, in the one-year certifications, in the two-year degrees, in the kind of job force that we need in this country, and the dignity, as Sherrod Brown has noted so well, the dignity of the work that your members do, because that is where I come from. So my dad got that degree, then he went on to get a four-year community college degree and a four-year University of Minnesota degree. He became a sports writer. He got to interview everyone from Chicago Bears coach Mike Ditka to Ginger Rogers. All right, there you go. So my mom, she grew up in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, the site of our next Democratic Convention. Uh, and where I'm going to be tomorrow night for a town hall, so tune in at 5.30. So my mom grew up there. She came to Minnesota. Why? She wanted to be a teacher. And what did they have in Minnesota at the time that they didn't have in Wisconsin? Strong teachers unions, right? She was actually in the first strike uh, that they had with the Minneapolis teachers. She taught second grade until she was 70 years old. And I still have people come up to me and tell me she was their favorite teacher. So I stand before you today as a proud, proud, proud child of unions. My grandpa is an iron ore miner. Union saved his life. My dad still remembers those caskets lining the Catholic Church because before there were strong unions, every day people would be getting hurt. They'd be dying every month. There'd be a siren that would go off and my grandma would run to that mine because you didn't know whose husband or whose son or whose brother had died. So I stand before you today as that granddaughter of a union iron ore miner, as a daughter of a union newspaper man and a union teacher, as a first woman elected to the United States Senate from the state of Minnesota and a candidate for president of the United States. That is what this country is about. That is what this country is about. None of this. None of this would have happened without unions. So as president, I will bring one clear but simple guide to the White House, and this is it. When unions are strong, our economy is strong. When unions are strong, all workers are strong. So a few years ago, I was talking to a worker uh, from Ohio. And she was telling me um, that when things were going OK for her, she saw uh, this uh, bumper sticker that said, restore the middle class. And she thought, oh, that's nice. You know, it's a bumper sticker. And then her husband lost his job. And then she, had a, she lost her good job. Then she had to start working two jobs. And she told me pretty soon she didn't just see those words as a bumper sticker anymore. She saw those words as a prayer. So my friends in the machinist union, those words restore the middle class. They shouldn't just be a bumper sticker. They shouldn't just be a prayer. Those words should be our reality. Yeah. That's what we need to do. So how do we do that? We make sure that we have strong, strong unions. 
Uh, we make sure that we govern from opportunity and not from chaos. We should never hold our federal employees and the employees of federal contractors hostage for political gain. That is number one. That's why, as president, I'll fight to guarantee back pay to our federal contractors if we have any government shutdowns. But when I'm president, we're not going to play games like that. Because economic strength and stability only comes when there is shared prosperity. As Paul Wellstone, who is one of my mentors, who sadly died too young, the former senator from Minnesota, as he always said, we all do better when we all do better. So what does this mean? To me, this means a bread and butter agenda for America. It means taking on the issues that people are talking about, not just the issues that the talk shows are talking about. OK, that means, first of all, infrastructure, right? I made my announcement on that river because I want to make that point about grit, but also because I want to make that point that that place I was standing is a mile and a half where that bridge fell down in the middle of the Mississippi River. It wasn't just a bridge. It was an eight-lane highway. It was a bridge that my family drove over every single day. And as I said that day, a bridge just doesn't fall down in the middle of America. But that bridge fell down. And when it happened, we built it back again. But this is what we're seeing all over our country, which is crumbling infrastructure. And when that happens and we're getting D minus grades time and time again for our infrastructure, we can't let that happen in the United States of America. So that's why I put out a plan. And guess what? It's paid for. The president keeps throwing out figures, one trillion, two trillion. Maybe he'll be up to three trillion. But he never shows how he's going to pay for it. And I pay for it, my friends, by repealing the most regressive parts of that Republican tax bill. They brought that corporate tax bill. They brought that corporate tax down to 21% from where it was in the mid-30s. If you even go up to 25%, every point is $100 billion. Think of that, what that could do for jobs. Think of what that could do for our schools in Baltimore that didn't even have heat, for the water system in Flint. Think of that, what that could do when it comes to transit, when it comes to rail, uh, when it comes to rural broadband, and when it comes to those roads and bridges. This is what this is about. I believe if you're running for president, that you should have something you want to do and ideas. I believe you should show how you're going to pay for it, and I believe you should show how you're going to get it done. That's what I've done when I've been a senator. That's what I've done my whole life, and that's what I'll do as president. So let's get this infrastructure built, and let's get those jobs back to you. All right. One of the things that we battled the Republicans on in the past is Davis-Bacon, right, and making sure that those provisions, and I vow to you any infrastructure package I put out there will have Davis-Bacon protections, because otherwise we're not going to have the kind of jobs that we want. And I actually, in my job before I was senator, I was county attorney, and I did the prevailing wage work, not just for our county, but we helped counties all over the state. That was an important part of what we did. The other thing that we need to do is look at these consolidations that are going on across our country. Uh, we have too much big and too little competition. You think, well, what does that mean to me? Well, first of all, it means stuff to you when you are trying to call to get good prices on things, whether it's pharmaceuticals, uh, whether it is you're calling to get a deal on online travel. Do you know that when you call, when you go on the, um, on the internet and you try to get a deal on online travel, 90% of it is only two companies. They all have different names, but it's only owned by two companies. You look at what happened with insulin in this country, a lot of that was because we didn't have any competition, right? It went from 17 or $18 a vial up to $1,200 a month. I brought a woman to the State of the Union named Nicole Smith-Holt, and she sat there and looked down at the president when he gave that speech, because all she heard was a bunch of rhetoric. And what has happened for her? It meant she lost her son. He aged off her insurance at age 26, and he started to ration his insulin, because he couldn't afford the 1200 a month, and he died. 
That happened in our country. Why would a simple drug like insulin go from 18 bucks a vial to $1,200 a month? Why would a drug like EpiPens, right, that you use for allergies, why did that suddenly shoot up the way it did? You can see it across the board. It's happening four out of 10 drugs in America. The top selling drugs have their prices went through the roof. It's because there's no competition, and it's because the pharmaceutical companies think they own Washington. Well, they don't own me. I think what we need, we have got the people on our side on this. They're sick and tired of all these big mergers without any accountability, which leaves the jobs behind and the prices up. That means changing the standards where we look at the mergers. And by the way, when you look back at this gilded age from the past, because we're in a new one right now, this started with unions, union striking in Chicago. That's how we got the protection. It started with farmers. It was called the Grangers. They were out there with their pitchforks. That's what we have to do right now. And it's about taking on those antitrust laws and making them work better for people, but it's also about bringing down the cost of health care. I have stood by you uh, when we looked at some of these issues that got on, in our way, when we are trying to bring the cost of health care down and make sure that we have quality plans across the country. We must continue to do that, but that doesn't stop us from making the Affordable Care Act better, from bringing the premiums down, and also from taking on pharmaceutical companies so that we can get better health care for everyone in this country. And that brings me to um, the, this uh, mental health issue and the addiction issue. So I took this on because my dad struggled with this his whole life. He was a very successful writer, uh, but he was an alcoholic, and he drank all through the time I was growing up. He got two DWIs when I was in middle school, and when I was just about to get married in the 90s, he got a third DWI. And back then the laws changed, and he had to choose between treatment and jail and he chose treatment. And in his words, he was pursued by grace. And by that, he meant his faith, he meant the treatment he got, he meant the community that came around him, he meant our family, and he meant his friends. And he has been sober ever since. He is now 91, he's in assisted living, and in his, his words, he told me this a few months ago, it's kinda hard to get a drink around here in the assisted living anyway. <laughs> But the truth is, his AA group still comes to visit him all the time. And I believe that everyone in this country has that same right to be pursued by grace. And that includes mental health issues, and that includes addiction issues. And right now what we've got, we've got a lot of campaign brochures going out there about what people did on opioids. And there has been some good things that came out of both administrations when it came to opioids. But there's still not the kind of funding we need for beds in this country. Ask police officers and firefighters who are on the front line who go to those calls and have to be both a cop and a firefighter and a doctor at the same time. We don't have enough beds. I have shown how I'm going to pay for this. We don't have enough counselors and people helping people in workplaces, and people all over the country say they don't know where they can go for help. Well, we're going to change this, and we're going to change it. How are we going to pay for it? Because I think you've got to show how you're going to pay for things. Well, guess what? There's a bunch of companies out there who've been selling people opioids who made millions and hundreds of millions of dollars off it. I think they're the ones that should be paying for the treatment for people across this country. That's how we pay for it. So last thing I just want to mention is the importance of keeping unions strong. And that means, of course, the judges that we put on the courts, that they respect the dignity of work and understand how important it is um, to have judges that are in line with enforcing the laws in this country and understand how important it is to not mess around with them. We know anti-union campaigns and tactics are growing. Loopholes in the law have allowed for attacks on our unions, delays in union elections, and attempts to delegitimize and decertify our unions. Labor law reform, in a good way, is long overdue. And that's why, as president, I'll strengthen the National Labor Relations Act and the Railway Labor Act. Hey. I will take on... 
I will take on these right to work laws in all of these states. And you know how you do that? You do that by leading a ticket. Every time I've led our ticket in our state, we have won. We just won our Senate seat when I was in the lead. We had two Senate seats up at the same time. We won in our governor's race in a very purple state that Donald Trump almost won. And we flipped the state house that had been Republican. That means leading, right? Leading not just for one office, but leading for the entire ticket. So you have a movement. And that movement is about people and showing them that you have their backs. Because we're not going to be able to change a lot of this stuff unless we also change what's going on in our governor's offices and in our state legislatures. And you around the country know exactly what I mean. And if you don't believe it makes a difference what you've done, you look at that people's house and how you switch that, and you look at one other thing. I've got four words for you to show you what you've done. Former Governor Scott Walker. All right? So we can do this. We can do it in every nation. We can build on the success of 2018. We can do it from the ground up, as your president likes to say. And we can win this election. Let's get to work. Thank you, machinists.